We should have all brought our presents and opened them here, right? <laughs> Uh, never mind. Okay. Well, Merry Christmas. I don't think this happens again for a few more years where it lands on Sunday. <laughs> but uh, how, how many got up early and opened your presents this morning? Huh? Look at those pa- Oh, there you go. <laughs> Look at all those patient people. <laughs> you know. All right. Presents? What presents? Anyway, I don't see any first-time visitors, but our, we have a visitor's card on our bulletin. And <laughs> fill out and take it off and put it on the back table, give it to an usher. Uh, there'll be no service Wednesday, this Wednesday between Christmas and New Year's. We'll pick up after the New Year. Uh, the church uh, will be used this week after Christmas for, the, uh, for John and Trisha's uh, uh, wedding, which will be on Saturday. And so uh, not having any rentals this week, you know, so we're looking forward to that and uh, should be interesting. So uh, also in the back on the way out, we have our Christmas gift table. <laughs> so if you'd like to take something that's out there, we're good. Oh, OK, that's right. I just <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Two for one sale. <laughs> So anyway, so hopefully you'll find something. Um, you know, if, if you're into chocolate, get there early. Uh, anyway, not, not right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, take an extra one to say for David. No, never mind. Uh, men's breakfast will be held January 7th. Is that good? Okay, no, no, not good. Okay, we'll have to we'll have to figure that out afterwards. Okay, so we'll have to figure out when it'll be good. You know, Todd's probably going deer hunting or something. I mean, no, no, same thing. <laughs> okay, well, I hope the roads are open. Well, Merry Christmas to everybody, and you know, some food for thought. I talked with the teens Wednesday night. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? It's a classic answers. I mean, you have it. Micah, okay, will be born. You had the census, right, that forced them to go there. But that's where the sacrificial lambs were all raised for the temple. And guess what? John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And just how they had to watch those lambs that they were perfect and met the requirements that God made in his word Jesus was watched carefully while he walked the earth, too. And yet they said he was a man with no sin, no guile. So think about that. Maybe you've learned something new this morning. Yeah, the sacrificial lambs were made there. So what better place for him to be born than Bethlehem? All right, we're going to read from Colossians today. And it's in Colossians 1, 13 through 20. And you can follow along as I lead. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed, unto, un, conveyed us into the kingdom of his son in love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by, all, by, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities of, or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things that he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. All right, would you all pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you again for this day of celebration of our Savior's birth, even though we know not the exact day that he was born, but we do take this time once a year to remember that he came to earth and left the glories of heaven to live amongst us, to be born as a man, and Lord, suffer and die on the cross for our sins, and Lord, face all the temptations that we face, and the trials and tribulations of this life, uh, Lord, since sin entered the world, and Lord, he faced all these things, but yet did not succumb to them. 
And Lord, we thank you that we have this example to live our lives by. And Lord, we just pray now as we go through the coming year that we can be a, a fine example of Christ living within us, Lord, with others who are lost and know not what tomorrow holds for them. And Lord, uh, encourage us as we come together and fellowship with one another. And Lord, as we continually learn and Lord, as uh, you have the pastor lead us each week, week and Wednesday night, Lord, in the study of your word, Lord, to commit it to our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, we just pray your blessing upon our time here together this morning as we celebrate uh, Jesus' birth. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Christmas message this morning is not going to be taken from the manger passage, but over in John 17. John chapter 17. This is, of course, the Lord's high priestly prayer. The story is told of a man in England named Mr. Green. Mr. Green was walking through the woods one day and enjoying a country walk when he ran across another man that looked vaguely familiar. Now, the other man obviously knew him because he said, Ah, oh, Mr. Green, how you doing? It's good seeing you again. He said, well, good seeing you, too. And all along he's thinking, who is this guy? I've seen him somewhere. He said, how, how, Mr. Green, how's your, how's your wife and, and, and kids and your two sons and your daughter? He said, they're doing fine. Oh, he really knows me. He said, uh, um, they're doing fine. They're doing fine. He said, well, are you still working over at the foundry? And he thought, he knows even where I work. You know, I've seen him in some gathering or something. He says, Oh, yeah, I'm still doing that. Are you still doing what you're doing? He said, oh, yes, I'm still the king of England. And so King Edward, <laughs> king of England, he didn't recognize his own king, <laughs> even though his king recognized him. And that is quite often the case with Jesus. They know about the baby, they know about the birth, but they don't recognize him as their king. And so that's what I'm going to take a look at in John chapter 17, that you might honor the baby, you might honor the story, but unless you submit and put your trust in the king, you don't know him. Just like Mr. Green did not know his king, <laughs> quite often people know the story, but not that Jesus is king. John 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke to these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. As you have given me authority over all flesh, that he shall give eternal life to as many as you have given to him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself and with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Who was born in Bethlehem but the Lord, creator of the entire universe. <laughs> you enter the world in incarnate form in the lowliest of fashions. He was a high king and high priest. This is his high priestly prayer. He's born of a peasant girl, one who no one in history would have pointed out for any special favor, but under the Lord's divine wisdom and will, she was the one chosen. He was born away from home. Didn't even get an opportunity to be born in Nazareth, where the family was from, but in a stable surrounded by animals. He had no family present. No aids, 
No nurses. <laughs> Nothing, just in the stable. But God had to even provide his own witness. He had to send the shepherds. He had to send the angels. And eventually, a couple years later, the wise men. He had no biological father. By the way, that's the reason he's called the second Adam. There's only two people ever uh, placed upon this earth that had no earthly father. One was Adam, made by God. One was Jesus, whose Holy Spirit fashioned a body within Mary. <laughs> All the rest of us had a mama and a papa. <laughs> and so it's the second Adam. Joseph was a carpenter in Nazareth of Galilee, a minor town. As a matter of fact, if you remember right, the Pharisees and priests mocked Nazareth, say, you know, uh, take a look. Uh, no prophet has ever come out of Galilee. Well, actually, it's not true. Uh, Jonah actually came out of Galilee. Nazareth is kind of an interesting word. It means branch. It's where the east-west uh, trade route came, and you had to make a choice in Nazareth to go continue west or east or go south towards Jerusalem and into Egypt. And so that's why the town was a crossroad. It's called the branch. That's its you know, main function is the fact you go on towards uh, Asia Minor or Turkey, go towards Syria, or you can head south. And a matter of fact, that's where Matthew picked up the play on words. You should be called a Nazarene. You know, the prophecy, well, the prophecy, there's no prophecy saying he was from Nazareth, but there were prophecy that he'd be called the branch. And in Hebrew, the word is Nazar. And uh, so we find that in Jeremiah, we find that in the Minor Prophets, we find that in Ezekiel, that he is the branch, you know, who will put the branch of Israel and the branch of Judah back together again, right? So the branch. And before Jesus is 30, Joseph had passed away, obviously. We see Joseph when he's age 12 in Luke chapter 2. Uh, but then we don't see him. And so Jesus probably had to raise the, the, the brothers and sisters. He had four brothers who are mentioned in Matthew 13, 55. And some sisters. I mean, the girls are just, you know, sisters. We don't have many sisters, he says. And his sisters. <laughs> at least two, right? I mean, uh, at least in normal English, you know, that's at least have two sisters. And so he doesn't start till 30. My friend, I always found it intriguing that he had four half brothers and sisters, and perhaps there's descendants of Jesus' half brothers and sisters or around today somewhere, and you know, descendants from Mary. I never heard someone say, Oh, by the way, I'm a descendant from Mary. And, you know, I never heard anyone say that, but there, there might be around sometime. I uh, had a walk of obscurity, and yet a walk where he became famous at the same time. In Isaiah 53, 2, it says that he had no form or comeliness that we should desire him. He didn't stand out. I imagine when Samson walked down the street, you knew it, right? Wow, look at that guy, you know. I, I'm sure he stood out. But Absalom stood out, we're told. He said he was a handsome man with long hair. And so, but Jesus was so common and so plain that when he was arrested, Judas had to point him out. Uh, the guy I, you know, kiss, he, he's the one, you know. And so there's no comeliness that we could have. He, he didn't have fame in the beginning of those 30 years like David did, who had uh, the Lord used to slay Goliath. Didn't have a claim like Solomon, all the glory of Solomon, in fact, Jesus mentions that in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, his nature was not revealed until the wedding of Canaan, where he turns water into wine, and only the servants and Mary and his disciples knew that that had happened. Uh, 
And so beginning through numerous miracles and through amazing teaching, matter of fact, remember when the high priest sent the guards out to arrest him, they came back empty because they said, no man has ever spoken like this. He said, are you bewitched also, they asked him. And so he had amazing teaching and he gained a following and he gained enemies. Whenever you threaten power, you got yourself some powerful enemies. And Jesus had that. But what was hidden in Jesus was his glory. I mean, can you imagine? He's a creator of the universe. And here he's walking in human flesh. You couldn't see light coming out of him. You couldn't see lightning bolts coming out of him. They couldn't see any of these things. He laid that side of, and Philippians chapter two and verse eight, it calls this the kenosis. In the Greek, it means emptying out. Laid aside. He didn't lay aside his deity, but the privilege of his deity. You know, matter of fact, he says, I don't do anything myself, but everything I do is of the Father. And so here we have the Lord laying it. Now, to me, there's a triple mystery here. I mean, for God to become man, could you imagine that experience? <laughs> and not only become man, all the power of creation, he created everything, all the power of creation, he, what, lays that aside. <laughs> I mean, I think the emptying out has two aspects. One, he emptied out of this period. Another one, he had to feel somewhat emptied himself, right? Because now he can experience fatigue, he can experience thirst, he can you know, experience all this stuff that we experience. And then the third part of that is the fact that he is going to die. God doesn't die. He's in a body that can be killed. And so that was all unique experience that Jesus did for us. And so all who saw him did not realize who he was, even though he tells his disciples in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. We find over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he will hold that authority till all his enemies are made his footstool, then he'll turn it back to the Father, he'll be all in all. And so before his incarnation, he shared glory with God. Can you imagine? He emptied all this out. He said, listen, glorify me so I might glorify you so that I might come back to you and share with you the glory that I had with you from the beginning. <laughs> I mean, the sacrifice is absolutely amazing. And to me, it's even a more amazing fact that Jesus will be in this body for eternity with the nail prints and the print in his side and the scars of the crown to remind us that he did it for us. No one knew that after he finished his task, he would glorify the Father who would glorify him in the resurrection. That's what the babe is in the major. It's not just a babe we're talking about. And no one knew that he was walking with the God of the universe. It's kind of hard to get your head around. And Jesus, that's why Henry, I had you read that. Jesus is the creator of all things. Could you imagine? He could be walking down there, and, and, and if he wanted to, he'd pull us to the south side and said, see Orion up there? I created that. And that, you think, is a star. It's actually Andromeda, which is another whole galaxy full of stars. I created those. As a matter of fact, the Hubble telescope has identified as at least a billion galaxies, and that's just as far as the telescope can see. There might be billions beyond that, and each one with hundreds of millions and maybe billions of stars in it. 
<clears throat> and Genesis summarizes this, and he created the stars also. <laughs> and Jesus could say, I created that. See these rocks, stones, I created that. Everything, he was master of the universe, but walking in flesh and laying aside the privilege of his deity. And he had appeared in the Old Testament in various forms. <clears throat> he appeared before Abraham. He walked with there, Genesis chapter 18, talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he uh, appeared before Moses. Uh, take off your sandals for where you stand is what? Holy ground. He will be came to Joshua. He says, no, I'm not on your side or their side. I am the, the master, you know, I'm the, the, the head of the host of the army of God, you know. Uh, he appears before Isaiah <coughs> where he looks up and sees him up <coughs> in the heavens in Isaiah chapter 6. <coughs> and then it says, you know, his train filled the temple and his glory filled the temple. He, he appeared before uh, Gideon, uh, almighty man of valor. <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> he appeared before Manoah. So he's going to be raising Samson. Can you imagine raising Samson? That would have been a little bit of a tough job. Uh, <clears throat> and so all that was he was was veiled when Mary looked upon him, looks like a baby. <laughs> And Joseph looked on him, looked like a baby. And they raised him as a son. And then the mystery, when he was 12 years old, said, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? Not talking about Joseph. <laughs> talking about his father in heaven. And so nothing indicated, no thunder was walking around. All the superstition in the Roman Catholic Church about him making clay pigeons and making them come to life and all that stuff. That's all nonsense, <laughs> you know. Um, so in three short minutes of ministry, he gave hints of his identification without revealing his total glory. He, he healed the lame and the leper. He made the blind to see and he raised the dead. He cast out demons and silenced evil spirits. He spoke words that no man had ever spoken. He turned water into wine and he multiplied the fish and the loaves. He calmed the storm and the waves with the, his hand in a, in a command. And, and they said, what manner of man is this that even the waves and storm obey him? He revealed what was in the hearts of men. And he predicted the future. And none of what he did was done in secret. When, when Paul stood before Agrippa, he said, these things weren't done in a corner. <laughs> these things are widely known. A lot of people saw him raise the dead and, and heal the lame. And, and a lot of them, you know, there are 5,000 men plus women and children there when the loaves were divided, when the fish were divided. It wasn't like this was all done in secret. His disciples saw him turn the water into wine and calm the storm. And his disciples saw him walk on water, which Peter tried for a short time. Mary, many people saw Jairus' daughter raised, the synagogue's uh, director raised from the dead. Thousands witnessed the multiplication of the food and many included the Pharisees and high priests saw Lazarus raised from the dead instead of bowing their knee. They said, we can't allow this guy to be going around doing this. And all who honor the babe without honoring the God dwelling in the babe miss the point and they miss eternity. It's not just a fuzzy story. It's just, just not something where you put a depiction of the manger scene on your mantle. It was interesting, the 1965 animation 
cartoon of the Christmas, the Charlie Brown Christmas. They want him to take out the scene where Linus comes out and quotes from Luke 2. He says, I'm not doing it at all unless that scene stays in there. And so millions heard the gospel through a cartoon character. <laughs> and so the Jesus who walked, who could have said, I created all this, <laughs> Is a Jesus who sacrificed himself on the cross. He was born to die. He was born to give his life. He was born to call mankind to himself that it might save the people from their sins. And he points to it up and says, I did this for you. The babe and the man on the cross are the same. The babe and the man on the cross and the man, God man, who sits at the right hand of the Father making an intercession for us, it's the same. You can't see the babe without seeing the cross. That's why for years I put out as our Christmas display a manger scene with a lighted cross behind it. (laughs) Because the cradle cannot be spoken of without the cross. And so the resurrected Lord is the same as the baby in the manger. You cannot have one without the other because if you try it, you don't have Jesus. Jesus is eternally God. No matter what form he took in the Old Testament and no matter what form he took in the New Testament, He's both creator and savior. If he's anything else, he's not the real Jesus. But one more thing as we close. He's a personal savior. He's a personal savior. Joining a church doesn't save you. (laughs) Following a litany doesn't save you. Singing hymns do not save you. (laughs) It's having your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior that saves you. If the baby is a resurrected Lord in your life, you got the right Jesus. <laughs> Anything else, you miss the point. <laughs> and you miss eternity. That's why John ends his first epistle of John with, He who has a son has life. And he who does not have a son, what? Does not have life. Do you know who the baby Jesus is this Christmas? If not, it's time to come to the resurrected Lord. Amen. Let's pray. The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time we've had here this day. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, that whosoever believes in him should have eternal life. And have an eternal life that we can live with you forever. Lord, thank you, Lord, for sending your son for us. And Lord, thank you, Lord, for the privilege of giving us the honor and task of telling others about the baby Jesus who was the Savior of the world. Or may this Christmas, if there's anyone listening online who's never actually come to Jesus Christ, maybe a member of some church body, but never personally received the Savior, that it do so this day for your glory, that we might honor the real Jesus of Christmas. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. In each service, I'd like to give a brief outline. Three basic points. One, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so this man is totally lost. No matter what he believes, he's lost because he can't enter heaven because evil can't dwell with God. And so since we're made in the image of God, and so this image is cast into this lake of fire. However, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He put that bridge across here, and that's Jesus Christ. 
He who believes in the Son has life. He who does not believe in the Son does not have life. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through him.